go ahead and get started here. What I have done here so far is put the uh, clear contact paper on the surface and with a dry erase marker I uh, have went ahead and started sketching out these cobblestones. And the reason I'm using this dry erase marker is because if I mess up, if I don't like the shape of these stone that I drew, get hit with some glass cleaner here, and it wipes right off, or for the most part the line is gone. So that's a nice little trick you can sneak in there if you want to. I had a problem the first two or three times I did this in my own bathroom, and uh, believe it or not, as simple as it may seem, uh, it's kind of difficult to go in and uh, draw these accurately. But uh, a buddy of mine actually who has a, a decorative rock business helped me understand uh, that they're pretty much random in their shapes. And what I'm trying to do here for the most part is minimalize the mortar joints here. This little area in between here. I'm trying to minimalize that. So I'm just going to draw a few more of these in here. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that this is a faux concept, like I said before. Uh, faux is going to be, uh, for some of you guys who have never even heard of the word before, F-A-U-X, faux painting. So, faux painting, what it basically means is something that looks like it's there, but it's not really there. So, what I'm trying to do here is not only uh, display this as a graphic type of um, concept with airbrush, but also uh, try to get people to think outside the box um, that they could do it on someone's wall, around their fireplace, um, on the side of a mini dragster. Uh, it's definitely a signage concept if you want to put it inside of uh, letters or fonts um, for a sign business. I will be using this Krylon Flexstone, which can be bought in any store to basically help uh, achieve not only a realistic looking uh, stone, but at the end it will also feel like it's an actual cobblestone. So it's very manipulative in its uh, textural properties uh, when you sneak other things like that in. So let me go ahead and get started here cutting these out. Now one thing I tell people is that when you're cutting cobblestone out, uh, it's very arduous to have to come in and cut every single cobblestone out with an exacto knife. So if you're a faux painter, one thing you might want to consider is doing a pre-cut stencil, a huge, maybe oblong, uh, boarded with thin wood trim or what have you, where you can basically just hold it up to this and just knock these things out, just spray them up quickly. But I've gotten uh, pretty fast over the years with cutting, so it's really uh, how you want to do it. All the clear contact paper is doing is just establishing an edge that I can shade against and then sneak in my textures later on. So, uh, the more power to you if you can uh, use pre-cut uh, stencils to come in and nail this out. So, I'll go ahead and start cutting these out here. And after you cut these, what you want to do is make sure that, this is just really good uh, masking etiquette 101, that anytime you take a mask off of a surface like this, in this case it's transparent, so we can see everything that's going on. Um, you don't want to take and yank it straight out like that. You want to try to roll this against its own pressure, uh, just like this. And this takes some discipline to be able to do, but try to roll it against its own pressure. Uh, what I just did is also going to come in handy if you have a layer of paint under there too. So um, the more you do that, uh, the better you're going to be. So I'll continue uh, digging this next piece and we will continue along here. Okay, let's go ahead and get started here. I basically got a puddle of white that I'm going to take some, um, a few drops of black, put it in here. One, two, three, and let's smear that around and see where we're at. Okay, so the main thing I don't want to do is take color and spread it right out of the bottle, so I want more of a, a buffer down gray when I'm doing something like this. I'm going to keep going wider and wider and wider. So, get a little gray type consistency like that. Smear that around, and that's probably what I'm looking for right there for my uh, sponging tone. Then basically what I'm going to do is sponge some of this on here. Now, for some weird reason, I always like to just sponge some texture on a reverse L on these cobblestones and leave the upper uh, left-hand corner of these voided. So 
This is just an underlying value to these stones. All the faux painters know how to get down with sponges and do things. So uh, sometimes it's a good idea to go in and switch the sponge so you can diversify the texture a little bit. I'm just staying off of the upper left hand sides of these uh, for dimension and for the sake that uh, for the purpose that Mother Nature has done what she wants to do in the same way with all these cobblestones. So the best you can try to stay off the upper left hand sides. So this is my underlying texture and one thing I want to mention is that I've got very little pressure on the sponge. You don't want the weight of your hand uh, smashing down a real cheesy texture and do what I call rubber stamping. You don't want dots all over this thing so take the weight of your hand off the sponge. And I even had a 13 year old kid in my class one time that actually twisted it randomly. And that might also help you. So this tone right here can be lighter or darker depending on the nature of how you want the uh, the rock to look and the value of the rock. So I'm going to go on to the next step here which is some freehand shading around the uh, perimeter. So again when I'm mixing my white here I probably got about I don't know 95 percent opaque white with a couple drops of black so or tinted gray regardless but uh, this is the tone that I want to get when I'm shading the perimeter of these rocks here. So with my airbrush, this is the uh, Aztec 4709 again. I'm going to stay this hands distance back when I'm shading these things. So, and this is what I'm saying. Now for the purposes of the video, I'm tilting my airbrush to the side. So you're not just staring at my hand, but I've told all my students that the five or six inches that you need to stay away from the surface in the beginning is going to be real important when you're shading these things. Because actually what we're trying not to do is go in and put real cheesy edges along the uh, perimeter of the mask here. So uh, I'm going to shade all these. And again, I'm staying off the upper left hand corners of these rocks here. Nothing fancy. I think I'm on around 50 PSI when I'm doing this. What I've taught my students over the years is that when you're doing something like this, less is always better. Uh, because again anything in nature especially something like this uh, you think more about edges and buffered colors than you do uh, real crisp loud things going on if that's one way to characterize it so I got a problem over here on this right hand stone where my mask has ran out so I'm going to take this little tape off Again, this just saves you from having to do a lot of unnecessary masking. Because this is going to be a good demo piece and I don't want to uh, have overspray killing everything. So, uh, what I'm not doing is going in violating this distance and putting a cheesy stripe over here. Again, this distance that you're staying at is your safety net. Because if your airbrush surges or starts to clog on you, uh, then you're back far enough to where you should be a lot safer. I'm going to build another tape wall up here. I can always trim this down when I'm done. I'm just trying to show you guys good habits to get into when you're painting. Okay, so I don't need much more on this. I'm going to come in here and really lightly dust these. So nothing on the upper left hand corners. And the next trick is I'm just going to come in with a paper bag or something like that. It can be a puffy piece of cardboard, it really doesn't matter. But when you rip it, I think the ripping is very important. This is almost a perfect rip, so I'm not going to mess with it. The more you rip things at a 45 degree angle, I think the better off you're going to be. If you rip something and you have a bunch of what I call Charlie Brown t-shirt points in the rip, take those out if it's uh, too pointy because it really looks cheesy and not very natural uh, if you do that. So uh, this is what I'm looking for, 45 degree angle here. I'm just going to come in and a lot of people try to overthink this, but you want to come in here 
and put recessions in the rock basically. And I'm going to test the flow on the paper. And here's the move. When you're doing this, you want to spray just to create an edge like that. Um, a lot of people think that you have to spray and just slice through this thing and move it. And you don't have to do that. The move basically is just spray and roll around the perimeter here. Spray and roll. And again, I'm not using really cheesy loud black when I'm doing this. This is a, a buffered down color or a muted color. So, okay, that's basically the move. And then if you want to be cute, you can come in here and do a little V-chip on these two. A V-chip. Um, basically, you just spray on one side like this. And you spray on the other side. Okay, and it looks chipped and so on. So, I'm going to finish this up. And then I'm going to be coming in here with other colors and flexstone as we roll along here. So I'm going to crawl along here. For the purposes of the video I'm going to fly. Sometimes when you move real quick too, especially when you're faux painting, uh, things turn out better. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to put another rip in it so that I'm not too redundant on my edges. Uh, usually bad art is the product of being lazy. So the more you can diversify your edges, uh, the better off you'll be. Come down here. And again, this presupposes that all these rocks are really distressed and aged and so on and so on. So you can get as close as you want when you're doing something like this too. It really doesn't matter. <clears throat> and I'm almost done. Eventually this bag gets waterlogged if you want to use paper... Not, not paper towel, but cardboard. Uh, it's going to be a lot more sturdier. So, one thing I want to footnote here is that can you come across a rock? I know that uh, people in their habit, I saw hundreds of people do this, they want to stripe just straight across like this. You can do it a couple passes because rock can have like a shelled, chipped type of look. Let me get a side that isn't worn out here. One, two, three. And it can look like it uh, has, you know, a chipped or a shale type look to it. So if you do that, just don't get too redundant on it because it'll look silly. You can even smear it back a little bit if you need to. Okay, moving on here, what we're going to do is I'm going to sneak in some other colors here. Um, when I think about the mineral colors of rocks, I always think of my dog digging in the ground for his bone. And any of those little earthy colors that you see um, will work as the mineral colors for the rock. Um, I think hopefully the tone we're setting here is that you're going to be staying as neutral as you can in your colors. And um, I have raw sienna here. Um, basically then I have terracotta. And then I have this uh, muted green here. So uh, again, if you come in with loud colors, it's going to be too much. So we will apply these with the sponge and move on. Okay, so moving on here, what I'm going to do is take this raw sienna. I'm just going to lightly dab this on here. I could even add white to these colors uh, to make them more believable. But sometimes minerals and rocks are pretty dominant looking. But for the most part you want to try to still use a neutral color palette when you're coming in here and doing this. Again, a lot of light pressure on this sponge. And at this point I can violate that corner a little bit but not much. I don't want it to be totally white and void, but the sands of time or whatever are taking this texture, hopefully in a continuum, the same way, the same color, and so on. So, And then we're going to go to the burnt sienna color. Again, test this sponge off to the side, and really lightly dab this on here, because I don't want to run my gray texture that's underneath it. And even though this looks real dominant, when I come in with the flexstone, it actually subdues all this color jump here and it helps the overall texture of the rock. So color's everything when you're doing things in nature, that's for sure. 
That's the terracotta. I'm going to go on to the green now. And with the green, I want to go to a different part of the sponge if I can, as much as possible. Test it off to the side. And rocks actually look however they want to look. I think people find just as many rocks and types of rocks every year as they do fish and other creatures. So a little bit of green here. Make sure this is actually saturating into the surface. And this actually calms the layers of texture down as we're going along here. This may even take on not only the mineral look of the rock, but maybe even a mossy, slippery river rock or something when you're adding green. Um, I almost feel like Bob Ross doing stuff like this. It's kind of winging it as I go, but just keep your colors muted and buffered and you'll be fine. Okay, zooming out here, as you can see I've got the texture of the foundation built up here. And what I'm going to do is sneak in some flex stone. Now the uh, flex stone, uh, this is called Make It Stone by Krylon. Uh, there's uh, different kinds of uh, flex stone out there, but whatever you do, just make sure that when you're doing cobblestone, to stay in a, a neutral color palette, because if you get too loud, it just negates the realism. So with this, I'm going to shake this up real good here. I'm going to test the flow off to the side. I'm going to basically spray center mass center mass and the center of the stones and as you can see it takes away all the primary tones and it calms them down so in the end when I'm spraying this flex stone it not only creates a look of realism but when people run their hands over it it will create um, a feel that the rocks are also actually there this stuff smells really good my students always laugh because I always say it smells like a, uh, a swimming pool, but it really, really does smell good. So, um, I mean, don't breathe too much of it, but it really pulls off its uh, objective, which is to add to the texture. So what I'm going to do next is expose this mask and come in and do the, uh, the shadow behind it, all the rocks. So what I'm going to do next is come in, take the mask off, and go ahead and do the... Um, the shadows of the rocks which actually create the mortar joints and we'll talk about the color of the mortar as we uh, go along here. Okay, a little uh, realism 101 here. Watch what happens when you have neutral edges against a solid white background. You can relate this concept to uh, doing portraits, uh, glamour type portraits against solid white backgrounds, but when you take a neutral color palette and some nice fancy little edges against a white background, uh, realism is created pretty easily. So I'm always exploring that type of uh, a dimension and concept in art. Uh, flowers are the same way. So keep that in mind that color is everything when you're trying to create realism. Muddying your colors, you can call it whatever you want. Um, and again, try to peel this mask as much as you can against its own pressure. So what I'm going to do next is come in here and do these drop shadows, or cast shadows, uh, however I want them to look, and we'll move on to the next step. I don't want to come in with a real loud black because that would be way too much, and I may even calm this down, but we can presuppose there's some cracks in the rock. I like to smash those down so they're not too dominant there. You don't want it to be too cartoony. And I like a sable brush because it basically, and again, I go to the end of my hand when I'm using this because it gives me a more finite line when I'm doing this. Again, black would have been way too much for something like that. So what I can do is come in here and hit a few of those here and there. Make sure you fade them out too. A lot of people have a tendency to, again, to do uh, chicken feet all over the place. Okay, so that's the next step. We'll go on to the highlight here which is the last part of this, and then we'll talk about mortar color. Okay, moving along here, I think what we're going to do is take a toothbrush here. And I get too carried away with this. I'm going to come in, and you actually, with a design like this, uh, you can come in with something like a toothbrush and just nail this uh, mortar down with little black speckles, little stipples here. 
just be careful. It's usually not going to uh, interfere with your cobblestone effect, but it's something you can just sneak in at the end here to presuppose that this is on some type of mortar. So we'll zoom in a little bit there and see how you can catch that. It's more like uh, stone or concrete. And the cobblestones are more decorative looking that we've created. So that's how we can nail down the mortar. It's a little bit more looser than you think. It doesn't have to be as controlled at this point because we already have a nice little texture on these rocks. Okay, going on to the sponging, uh, what I have here is some wicker white. And I want to kind of preface that a lot of these paints I'm using are for, uh, they're from Walmart. And it's not for budget purposes. It's more or less that they just have some of the cooler colors that you can go through a ton and just totally abuse them. And they're not that expensive. So with some wicker white on my sponge, what I'm going to do is come in here and anything that I overworked, like those granite lines or the cracks or whatever, I can take my white and just lightly sponge over it. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit here and show you how not only does it add textural interest to the rock, but it could presuppose um, either a highlight or the mica that's in the stone. It doesn't matter, the stone or the rock. So make sure whatever you do, that when you dip your white in your sponge, that it's really thick, almost like a tempera type consistency. Um, grab a cool sponge. Some sponges are totally boring. You want to try to stay away from the sponges that have uh, nothing going on, like just the boring Swiss cheese, uh, you know, flat edge. Those don't do much for me. But come in here, you can see how this is um, giving it more of an organic look. And again, serves uh, a dual purpose of either a highlight or the mica that's in the stone. And again, what I was using it for was right here, me being a perfectionist, that it basically will help you get rid of anything that you overworked, which in this case was the, the crack in this cobblestone. So I will give all these the uh, same treatment here. Bounce around. You can switch the sponges up if you want to. But I think this is one last thing that comes in real handy uh, because you don't want this to look like dirty river rock. So this will actually pop out a contrasting value in all these stones. And one thing to mention here too, if you do get carried away with the white, you can actually tint back over the white with even blue. Blue might look really cool, um, light brown might look good. You can subdue any highlights that you get carried away with. So I will go ahead and uh, continue finishing this up. This does it for the cobblestone presentation. One thing I need to talk about here real quick is mortar joints, okay? And the base color of the mortar, what color could it be? Now, this type of stone would presuppose, uh, presuppose some type of dirty river rock or maybe even castle rock on a wall mural for a little girl's room or whatever. One footnote here on this flex stone is that they have a lot of different colors of this stuff. They have like a pastel color. They have a, a what is it, a lighter green. It's called Monet's Garden. But there's a lot of different colors of this stuff. So um, we're getting into the artistic part of this where, number one, every stone could be a different color. You could have this uh, lighter color that I've sprayed, but you might have a more pastel rock up here and you can jump around with different colors. Not only in the cobblestone, but in the other colors um, that I got from Walmart too. So your color palette's really up to you. You have choices between the uh, flex stone and the actual uh, colors that you put on your palette when you're sponging. So keep that in mind and just realize that it gets artistic at this point and it depends on the client and what they're wanting. The texture and the cobblestone is up to you. But also keep in mind that mortar uh, tends to be the same type earthier tones. Mortar could be this color here, the raw sienna, okay? Mortar could be uh, terracotta, it could be that color. Uh, mortar could be this color if you wanted it to be. It could also be a dark hunter green. I don't think it would be black. Um, you know, you don't, you don't want to stay with real, real loud colors when you're doing something like this. They all need to be those clay type of colors. 
So when you're rolling out a base coat um, for the mortar, what you need to do before you even lay these cobblestones, again, this is kind of a river rock princess room type cobblestone, uh, more typical in backdrops at a zoo or something. But if you're doing um, another type of mortar, a different color in the background here, okay, between these rocks, what you need to do is start off by taking a roller and roll out a total brown color. Get a big bucket of paint and just roll it out on the surface. Okay, let it dry, and then you're going to come in with something like this, your contact paper, and you're going to put it down on top of that color, and you're going to start cutting out the cobblestones like I did, and then you will basically take that roller again, okay, and you will roll them out with a white color, probably a bigger quantity than this, like a quart or whatever. And once that contact paper is on there and you're cutting these stones out, you will take the roller and roll the cobblestones out in white. That's called underpainting. And then after you do the underpainting, then you can for the most part do exactly what I've done here and discern, engage what type of colors you want to use on the rocks. But in a nutshell, if you want to go with a different color of mortar, other than white that I've uh, used today, then you can roll it out with a paint roller, roll the whole wall out, okay? Then the contact paper, then cut the cobblestones out, and then take the roller and roll the, uh, the cobblestones out with white. You don't want to airbrush them white because you'll get overspray everywhere and you're going to kill your lungs. So the airbrushing is just the thing that these uh, faux painters sneak in at the end to expedite the whole process and to achieve certain effects. So thank you very much and we will go on to the next texture at this time.